So today we're going to start with um, some slides that are previewing Assignment 102 to kind of get your, your minds thinking about Assignment 102 and the kinds of things that have been successful. I'm going to start first with a bunch of examples. Basically, it's all going to be examples. We're not going to talk too much about how it's done, more about the, here are some examples. And then today, when we're actually working on isolating objects, you'll start to see how these things come together. Um, but I'll start with a bunch of, quote, professional examples. So these are examples that I found online. And then I'll end with uh, a whole slew of uh, student examples so you can see work that students have done. And of course, you can go on the course website and find more uh, student work examples. And, and look at those uh, and to help kind of get your ideas put together for this particular assignment. So they don't always turn out within reason. The idea here is that you're bending reality. You're making things happen that aren't real. And the cool thing about Photoshop is that you can really make that believable. You can sell somebody on this idea that this fantasy or this fake thing is really real. You know, this person here looks real. And that's the point. So it's the kind of thing where you look at it and you say, well, wait a minute. Well, how did that happen? And you want to look at it more. And so that's really what I'm asking you to do. This is the simplest example of uh, setting something like this up in Photoshop. Uh, when you're looking at a mirror or some kind of a reflection, it's a very simple mask. So in this particular context, you take two pictures. The first picture you take is the picture that has person number one, we'll call this person number one, and his reflection in the mirror. So you set the camera up, you set, take the, you know, put it on a tripod, put it on a counter or something, and you take this first picture. Then you go, without moving the camera, and you replace person number one here with this person, right there, and so that is now person number two, and you take the second picture. So same camera, same angle, and whatever. Then all you're doing is masking off the inside of this mirror such that in the first image, this piece goes away. And behind the first image, you have the second image with the reflection in it. So it's a really simple thing to do. Selection, mask it off, and you have this looking at yourself when you're older sort of thing. Sometimes they are just plain creepy, but I had to throw a few creepy ones in there. Um, anyway, this is all the same artist that, that does creepy faces. This one I think would be a little bit more successful. It had some kind of a background. I think it's a very creative idea. It's interesting how they put it together. The shadowing is really nicely done. A lot of what I'll emphasize today is looking at light conditions in your photos and making sure the light conditions match. If you have one photo with light coming from the right and you have a second photo that you want to collage in and the light's coming from the left, they're not going to look right when you try to match them up. Next Monday, when you guys come back for class, we're going to spend the whole day integrating things into a scene. So we'll take the people that you cut out today and we'll put them into a scene on Monday and you'll learn a lot about making sure the light conditions match such that the people belong. You'll also learn a lot about adding shadows to make sure that people belong or that uh, the components that you integrate feel like they belong in a particular scene. Sometimes it's about seeing transitions. So in this case the shoes transition to the toes the key here is looking at the wrinkles in the leather and understanding that there's wrinkles on the knuckles in your toes and that those two are similar. And so making the transition through that can really help in this, in this context. Now, this one's a little bit more artistic, but it's, it's kind of in the same vein. Pulling one piece forward, a puzzle piece forward. Um, again, this is a masking strategy. This works particularly well because of the depth of field. The person's blurred in the background. Um, so we can't really see what's happening where that puzzle piece is missing. If it were sharp, it would be more difficult because the puzzle piece would have to have something behind it. Sometimes, and you'll see this in a lot of the student examples, there's drawing happening on top of a photograph. Um, so you get multiple layers of, of what's happening in a particular context. Sometimes it's, you have to see things. And this is kind of like, you know, you're, you're looking outside and you're, you're gazing up at the clouds and you see the, you know, whatever, the unicorn in the clouds, <laughs> whatever it is that you see. Sometimes you have to be walking around in the supermarket and see the ends of all the carrots stacked up and you say, what if one of them was an eyeball? And those are the kinds of things that can be subtle that can just make these images fun. And so while you're going around over the next uh, week or so, pay attention to those kinds of moments because you might be able to do that kind of collage work. I like this one. I think it's, it's humorous. 
the cracked ground transitioning to the eye. Love this one. So this one's actually fairly simple to do. You obviously have to have someone else help you take the picture or, or use somebody else in the picture. But you take the, the first picture, looking down at the feet, where the legs are obviously in the pants. And then you very carefully step out of the pants and you take the second picture. And essentially all you're doing is masking the inside of the pants into the first picture. So it's, it's a relatively simple thing to do to make that disappear. But it works really nicely. It's a very humorous, uh, well-designed thing. This is one of the professional artists that does this sort of thing for a living. This one I think is well done. It changes scale. So rather than just collaging one thing to the other, in this particular example they're changing scale. The person becomes small, the cat becomes big, but part of the reason that it's successful is so much attention has been paid to where the lights are. And the fact that the girl standing behind the, the coffee mug here has a shadow being cast onto the coffee mug. Those are the things that make this believable. If you took that shadow away, it wouldn't feel like she was an integral part of this particular scene. This one's just, I don't know, it's creepy, for lack of a better term. The kitten looking down at the reflection, same thing as that first one that I showed you with the mirror. Obviously, it's a little bit more challenging because I don't think you have a lion sitting around your house. So this particular example probably wouldn't work. Remember, you're not allowed to use pictures you find online. You have to take the pictures yourself. Bending rules, things like gravity. You can make gravity not exist. And those can be fun. You can change, you can make the kid so strong that he can hold up uh, the parent. These ones are beautifully done, but unless you have really high speed photography, you're not going to get there to be able to do this. It's, it's a more challenging thing. But I've seen it done with, with people in smoke. I've seen it done with these kinds of water collisions and, and droplets and stuff. They're, they're pretty neat. I know, this one's goofy but it's entertaining. I like this one too. Again, I, I don't have the little, the little, whatever they are, mice or rats or whatever, to take a, this particular photograph, but I still think it's pretty interesting. This one was, was also pretty creative in terms of how they come together. Um, the key here was the transition between the fish scales and the rock. And if you look really carefully in that region, so it's right there, if you look carefully at that transition between the rock and the fish scales, that's what makes this work. Because those two transition so well, you start to, wait a minute, what's going on? What am I seeing here? And that's a large part of the point of this. The shattering arms instead of the shattering uh, pot. This one's well done. I'd like to point out the lighting conditions here because these are ob obviously objects of different scales. So when you took the first image that was the power lines and the person with the sled, you have a certain lighting setup. You want to integrate the guitar into this scene. You have to think about how you're going to photograph the guitar such that the light is coming from the same angle. So you look at the first example, you look at the shadows, you say where is the light, where are the clouds, where is the sun, and make sure when you shoot the, the guitar, even if it's in a studio environment, if, even if it's inside, you make sure you set up lighting condition that's similar to make those two work together. I think this one's pretty funny. Uh, it's a good combination of different images. Unlike the one with just the pants and the feet, this one's a combination of three images because you've got the feet hanging at the end. So you go from the person ironing the clothes the clothes obviously have nobody in them, and then they go back to having somebody in them at the bottom. So it's kind of an inter interesting play on the same idea. A little bit more challenging to set something like this up, but still rather entertaining. So these ones, I'll show you a couple examples of these kinds of uh, blended scenes, where we have one scene that's in the bedroom, and then it transitions into the snowscape through the sheet. So this is you know, seasonal change or big changes that are happening. Uh, it can include changes in scale. I think this one's pretty entertaining where we've got the, the cloths that are being strung up that are changing the scene, they're changing the photograph to a sunnier horizon. I think part of what makes this work really nicely is the fact that it's set up such that this path looks as almost seamless. The only place that we see the divisions are up top right in the hanging sheets but by the time you get to the bottom it feels like it's all one scene so it's a really creative way of blending two photographs together 
Obviously, in a scenario like this, you'd have to set it up so that the weather conditions change. You have one picture where the weather's right, you know exactly where the camera is, then you come back on a different day and you take the same picture from the same location. So some of these are, are just different strategies. I think this one's pretty good, pulling the road in the tarp. Um, but again, it's a little bit hard to set that up. Um, but it's still rather interesting. And I like this one. So changing a perspective. So different images shifted on the side. I think part of the reason that this works nicely is because they've thought a lot about how the perspective works. So where the camera angle is versus where uh, the fact that the road tapers as it goes down to make it look like it goes down further and then it gets a little bit wider from that lower spot. So the person who did this has a fundamental understanding of what's happening in perspective, in three-point perspective, such that you get the right vanishing points to make this feel like it's a believable scene. Transitioning from fall into winter with the needle and the thread. I think it's kind of a creative one. Same, same idea as like the road example. Bending reality. Obviously, the dog's not floating with that number of balloons, but it's still an entertaining uh, setup nonetheless. OK, so let's move on into the student examples. Those were all ones that I found online uh, done by professional photographers. And we're going to move into the student examples from this particular class. And these range from um, probably eight or nine years ago uh, up till more current. Same strategies happen. It's seeing an object inside another object. So in this case, the dog's head inside the rock, and then doing some, some work to transition those two together. Arash did this quite a while. I think this was probably in 2008. He does not have all of those tattoos, but he added the tattoos uh, and kind of changed himself uh, and made this rather political statement. This one ended up being a little on the creepy side, but I think it's very, very well done uh, in terms of how it's set up inside the apple. I think the background's a little bit stark. The whole thing is, is set up a little bit too dark. This one also is one of my favorites because of the subtlety of it where it, you really have to look at it a couple times to see what's happening. And the way that uh, he blended the noses together in particular is really, really nicely done. So this one's not the most spectacular image. It's not the most <laughs> compositionally intriguing image. However, I like this one because it's a really good example of how consistent lighting conditions make an image transition together. So in this case, both images were not the best images. They were shot front on with a flash but they were shot in the same lighting conditions. So when, you, when he shot the dog's head, it was in the same angle with the same lighting conditions as when he shot all the pigs. That made the transition of the two images come together really nicely. So again, it's about lighting conditions. It's about making sure that you've, you've set those things up for success. Sometimes they end up being a little bit more artistic. I'm OK with that. They blend the bounds a little bit more uh, into the art side versus the true photography side. That can work out nicely. The dress becoming the flower. Here's another one of the examples with the drawing. So in this case, it's the hand-drawn hand that's drawing the tattoo. Um, breaking the picture frame can be a good idea where you have the hand reaching in from outside. This was the one that was on the handout for you guys. It's kind of similar to the one, the pants with the feet in it. The shirt's hanging on the wall, but then it transitions into the person standing against the wall. Um, again, shot. In the same location, two images, one with the person standing there, one with just the shirt hanging there, and then transitioning the two together or masking the two together. The context of this should look very familiar. This was shot here at school. Um, in this particular example, obviously she can't fly, she can't levitate, but you're bending reality. She sat on one of the stools from the lab uh, and then took the same picture without the stool there, without anything there, such that she could um, use the, the um, masking tools to get rid of the stool. But I think the important thing is that she was very careful about how the shadow responded. So it wasn't just about getting rid of the stool. It was about making the shadow reflect the fact that the stool was gone. And that's part of why it works. The strong shadow, the strong lighting conditions really make this one work nicely. Another example, 
of the same vein, woke up in the morning, I have no legs. Same setup, two, two photographs, one with the person there, one without, and then you collage the two together or you mask the two together. Rather simple set of masking images, again, two images shot in the same context, same angle, same lighting conditions, and masking <coughs> one through the other. This one ended up being a little bit more artistic, but again, seeing certain shapes and then setting up that to work. The smoke, the smoke drawing. This one's really subtle. It might take you a while to see it. It's the face in the bark. But it is there. Uh, and it was very, very well done. Subtle, but nicely done. Composition is strong uh, on the one-third line. You guys have seen these around before with the profile um, and the, the front face. Drawing into a photograph. Sometimes it's about setting up the scene to tell a story. I think this person was a little inspired by the whole Walking Dead movement. This was a few years ago. Um, same concept. And then I'll end with this one, uh, which was a series of, of different images that were, that were put together to create that particular scene. OK. So hopefully that gives you some place to kind of get started thinking about what are you going to try to do. Um, the, the sooner you think about that and you kind of come up with your ideas, the better. Because as you start to, to develop this and, and try to put pieces together, you'll find that, oh, that image didn't quite, the angle's not quite right. Let me go back and retake it. And, and you'll get to the point where those images will, will combine together nicely. Um, it's not something to rush through. It's not something to do in the last second. It's not due until a week from Monday. So we still have a lot of time. It's due on October 1st. So you still have some time to kind of play around with this a little bit. Today, we're going to work on isolating objects. So we're going to get rid of backgrounds. Next class, we're going to work on integrating objects into a scene. So both of these lectures are critical for your masking skills and to be able to do this assignment. So today, coupled with Monday, we'll get you set up. And then you'll have the balance of the week and the weekend to get these to actually come together. So I'm going to switch over to uh, the other computer, and we're going to talk about isolating objects uh, today. So hold on while I switch over, and then we'll keep going. OK, so t this exercise, exercise 107, has two kind of major parts that we're going to work with. Uh, the first one, we're going to try to isolate some images. And then on the back, we're also going to deal with tiling textures. And uh, these were things that I used to separate out into different lectures, but the way that the semester's gone and the fact that the classes got longer and the semester got shorter, we're going to do them both in, in one, um, one setting. So bear with me. It'll be a little bit to get through all of it, but you'll also learn a lot of skills in the process. So uh, we're going to start with isolating images. And the key here is that when we talk about isolating images, uh, the images that you start working with are the most important pieces of the puzzle. If you start with a bad image, Isolating the object doesn't get you anywhere. If you start with an image that's low resolution, you get into isolating the object, it becomes pixelated, then you can't really use it. So you want to make sure that, one, it's a good, sharp, quality image that you're working with. You also want to make sure that it's a big enough image. And you also want to make sure that it contains the whole person. If you pick an image where the person is cut off at the waist, you can only ever use that person again in an image where they're cut off at the waist. So if we have the whole person, we have the option of putting the whole person in the scene. We can make them smaller. We can make them bigger. We can also cut them off at the waist if we decide we want to. So we've got a lot of flexibility in where the person uh, ends up falling. So the other thing that's important about selecting an image uh, is that you want to find a person that generally is standing. The problem with people that are sitting uh, or leaning against something is when you go to collage them into a scene later, they have to be sitting on something or leaning against something, and that something has to be in the scene. If they're just standing or running or walking uh, independently, it's pretty easy to integrate them into a scene. So when we're looking for images, that's kind of what we're looking for. So I've gone ahead and I did a Creative Commons search and found some images to pick from, but I'll, I'll show you the process along the way. So I did search.creativecommons.org. Again, I'm choosing the Creative Commons image search because I'm picking the kinds of images that people are allowing me to work with. They're not copywritten images. 
Um, so the only thing I need to do is give credit to the people and where the original photograph came from, which I'll ask you to do in your post. Um, so I'm going to work with the Creative Commons image search as I'm going through this. You also, in your uh, exercise 103, were asked to take pictures of people. If you have pictures of people, you're more than welcome to use your own pictures of people, in which case you don't have to worry about this as much. So um, I'm going to go ahead and search for a term like uh, you know, man walking, for example. You could choose to search in either Flickr or the Google image search. Um, I used to always search in Flickr. I had some bad results in Flickr, so I went ahead and went to Google images. Either way is fine. Um, when you go to Google images and you start this search, a couple things to do. One, go up to your, um, your tools, if they're not showing, turn on your tools, and then go over to the size dropdown and make sure that it is larger than, in this case, I would say at least two megapixel. You could go to four, depending, but I'd say at least two megapixels. And it's gonna filter out all those small images. We don't want any of the small images. Uh, and even as it is, when you pick an image, you wanna make sure that it is a high enough quality image. So this one actually looks pretty good there. And this one looks like it would be a pretty reasonable cutout. So that's not a bad strategy. So what I tend to do is I tend to open these in tabs so that I can go back and pick from them later. So I'll open that one in a new tab. Sometimes you end up picking an image, like let's say this image, for example. Well, that one ended up being OK. I thought his feet were going to be cut off. But in this case, his feet are there, so that would be a fine image. Um, let me see. Trying to see if I can find one that's not so good. OK, here we go. So as much as you might want to use this image in your, in your collage work, we have a problem in that his legs are cut off. So you can only ever use this person standing in the foreground of a collage because his legs would always have to be cut off. So that's, that ends up being kind of problematic. So stay away from those kinds of images. Pick ones where the whole person is included as you go through. And like you can see, there's, there's lots and lots of these. So there's, there's lots of options. Uh, I need to show you a few things about how to deal with cutting images out, some of which are more challenging. This one, for example, that I already picked up, this man here, isn't too hard to cut out. He's pretty, he has pretty solid uh, lines around him. He'll be pretty easy. There are other people, like this one, that would be far more challenging to cut out. So again, I have the whole person. That's fine. But look at all of this hair. That's going to be a challenging one to cut out. I'm going to do this one because it's challenging for you guys today. But you can pick depending as you go through. Like this person here is a pretty easy one. It's pretty sharp. So I've gone ahead and I've picked some. I've downloaded some uh, as examples already that I'm going to work from. This will be one of the ones that I do first uh, so that you guys can see how I cut these people out. So I've gone ahead and I've downloaded them. I've always picked the high resolution. So on this one, for example, I make sure that it's big before I go in and save it. The advantage of a high resolution, as you can see, it's nice and sharp along the edges. It'll be an easy, good one to cut out. If the resolution is too low of quality, we'd end up not being able to cut it out clean. Um, so there's another example. I, like I said, I picked a bunch of different examples here um, as part of this. So I have them. I'm going to go ahead and open this in Photoshop. Uh, I could open Photoshop first, or I can go to Open With. And of course, it's not listed, so we'll just go ahead and open Photoshop. OK, so let me go ahead and open that. Like I said, I'm going to pick the, the, the man first because it's an easier cutout to start. Oops. I'm going to start with this one. And I'll go ahead and open it. So first off, before I, 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 I start isolating the object, I really don't need all of this background anymore. All I need is the person. So I'm going to use the crop tool, which is right here on the left side. It's the fifth tool down, crop tool. And I'm just going to pull in the sides so that I have only the person left. Not like that. 
because the rest of this object, the rest of the scene doesn't matter because I'm going to get rid of the background anyway. So I might as well crop it down to be just the person. And so there's just the person. If I press Control and then zero on the keyboard, it'll zoom in to fill the screen for me. And so now it's a matter of how am I going to go about isolating this person? How am I going to get rid of the background of this particular person? So first off, when I first open a scene like this, the background layer, which is my image, is italicized and locked, which means I can't actually do anything. So if I took the eraser tool, for example, if I can even find it, there it is, and I tried to erase something, well, it's not supposed to do anything because it's locked, but it is. What I want to do is I want to right click on the background and I want to say layer from background. And I'll go ahead and say OK. This then unlocks the layer and makes it called layer 0. And the difference here is that when I go to erase now, it's showing me a checkered background instead of white because that background is transparent. So you could take the eraser tool and you could work your way along the object like that. I don't really recommend that as a strategy. Instead, uh, I'm going to use a selection tool. And so there are a couple different selection tools available to me. Uh, the rectangular marquee is fine, but it's a rectangle, so that's not going to help me too much. Underneath that, I have the, the single row and the elliptical. I could combine those together, but again, it's not going to get me too far. Below that, I have the lasso tool, which would allow me to actually just kind of draw along the edge. But that lasso tool, it's still not that accurate. Below that, I have two kind of magic tools, one of which is called the magic wand, and the other of which is called the quick selection tool. I'm going to use the quick selection tool as my choice. And the advantage of the quick selection tool is that as you click and drag, it starts to try to find hard edges in your drawing. So for example, right, as I, as I click in here, it's looking for a nice sharp edge. So it's finding this fairly easily. It's missing a little bit of that hair. I can hold down the Alt key, or excuse me, why is it? Yes, the Alt key. There we go. I just didn't push the key hard enough. And you can see that my cursor changes from having a plus inside it to having a minus inside it when I do that. That means I can add back to my selection. So I'll add back to this. And maybe I'll add a little bit more there just to kind of fine tune the selection. Same thing, I lost his neck, so let's get that neck back. I lost a little bit of the shoulder. Let's try to get that shoulder back. Sometimes you have to work both sides of it a little bit. Don't forget these little objects inside. So that's in the crook of his arm there. Got to make sure I select that. I'm going to keep working here, going down. That was a great selection. It's selected right along the edge of the pant leg. Good, hard transition for us. Photoshop was good at picking it up. Here we go. I've got a shoe. I'm going to work my way around the bottom here. Nope, too much of the bottom of his shoe. Let's get rid of the bottom there. Keep going. Go up the inside. Subtract from. It does take a little bit of time to make sure that you get it all. And I'll keep working my way around. Oops. Hold down space to pan. That's pretty good. Let me zoom in right there. I'm going to make I'm going to use the bracket keys to make my brush head a little bit smaller so that I can go in and select this like that. Remember, if you did too much, you hold down the alt key and you can get rid of a little bit of the selection. Add a little bit more to the selection there, etc. I'm going to press control 0 so I can see the whole object. And so essentially, I have a selection that goes all the way around the outside of the person, including the two pieces in the arm. I need to add back in that part there. 
I'm going to go ahead and use my rectangular marquee and add that in. That was the part that I erased, and it's, it's being a little bit finicky in the selection. So now that I have this selection done, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit and pull it up to the top and take a look at the hair. So there's still little bits of hair that stick up in here that aren't quite right. Likewise, I have a little bit too much selection there. I can use, I'm going to go back to the, um, the um, quick selection tool here, and I'm going to go up to the select menu, and I'm going to come down to refine selection, if I can find it. Huh. Why am I missing it? So this is, this is an update. Obviously, it's different from uh, CS6. So I apologize. Bear with me for a second. Where is Refine Edge? I'm going to <laughs> zoom here. Okay, I'll have to look it up because it looks like uh, Photoshop has done some updates. But anyway, to find it, if you hold down the Shift key and you go to the Select menu and you choose Select and Mask, it will bring up the Refine Edge tool, which is the tool that I was I was asking you to find. And I apologize for that. I'll have to figure out what what they've changed and and make some updates. So the advantage of this tool is it allows us to go through and make some corrections really easily uh, to this. Uh, adjustment. There's a couple different view modes that are available to us, um, and depending on what we're trying to do, some are easier or more useful than others. So for example, the overlay kind of gives us an overlay of what we're working on. The marching ants gives us the dotted lines. On black gives us a black on our background. On white is white against our background. Black and white can be useful because it's like a cutout, where we have just the black and the white. Um, and so you can you can flip back and forth between all of these different settings. I'm going to do the on black for right now. And then under our settings here, under adjust edge, we're going to do a smooth of 3 and a feather of 0.3 as we start to work through this. And then what we'll do is we're going to paint over the edge of our drawing just a little bit. So we'll paint right along that edge. And you see how it changed from being a sharp line to being a little bit blurred and, and highlighting around a little bit of that hair right along the edge. So we'll go right along that edge. It'll help our selection right there. Work back up this side. Like that. So we're getting a little bit of the hair as part of the selection. Sometimes you make a mistake, you can hold down the Alt key and you can paint back in if you made a mistake. Um, we can also deal with this in a mask a little bit later on. So we'll work our way. We'll refine that edge just a little bit. Sounds pretty good. The bulk of this is probably OK already, but we could work through and try to refine that edge a little bit more, that edge just a little bit more, et cetera. Those are, that's shine against the, the suit here. The rest of this is probably fine. It's mostly in the hair that we're worried about. So I've gotten that part done. I'll go ahead and say OK on that selection. It looks like I've got a little bit of issue right in here that didn't select correctly. Let me hold down Alt and try to correct that just a bit. But again, when we do this in a mask format, we can always get it back. OK, so I'll press Control-0. I now have my selection made, and it really likes to deselect this. There we go. And now I'm ready to create that mask like we did last class. If right now, if I did the selection, 
and, and with the current selection, and I did the add layer mask, it's going to cut the person out, not the opposite. So instead, I'm going to go up to the select menu and choose inverse. There we go, which allows just the person to be selected. At that point, I'll go ahead and click on the add layer mask. And you notice that it cuts out the background. I have a, a, the checkerboard pattern on the background. That means this person is nicely cut out. The advantage here is that if there was something that I made a mistake on, if my selection was bad, let's see if I can find something, like that edge right there needs a little bit more of his jacket back, I can still use the paintbrush just like we did last class, uh, and I can paint in black and white, and I can get that edge of his jacket back. If I went a little bit too far, I can come back and I can adjust it there. So the advantage of this masking is that we can make adjustments after the fact. If I pan up and look at his hair, oops, I did a pretty good job. It looks like this is a little bit too see-through, so we'll do a little bit of an adjustment right on that edge. I'm going to paint in white and make sure that that stays solid right there. And that looks, that looks pretty good. That also needs to be a little bit more solid. So I'm just making a few little adjustments. Now that I have the person isolated, um, I'm going to go ahead and do my exports. So this is the next phase of this, is I need my exports. The first one is going to be just the person. So I'll go to File, and then Export. And the handout probably says Save for Web. I haven't updated that. And I'll do Export As. And so this is really important. The default format is JPEG. But if I did JPEG, it's going to fill in the background with white. And I don't want that. So I'm going to change the format to be PNG. And you see that right below PNG, there's a checkbox for transparency. I want to make sure that's checked, because that's going to allow me to keep this transparency and use just the object itself. So once that's done, that's good. We're not going to reduce the file size at all. We're going to leave it in its full size format. And then I'll go ahead and say Export All. I need to save this to my flash drive. And this is Evening Jogger. That's what it was called. That's fine. I'm going to add, uh, uh, after this, I'm going to add just color so that I know this is the color version. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. So I have Evening Jogger color. Now I want to convert this person into black and white. So same thing we did before. I'll go up to my layer, New Adjustment Layer. And I'm going to use my um, channel mixer for black and white. I'll check the monochrome box. And I'll run through the various presets, making sure I pick the one that I like the most. Well, that one looks pretty good. I'll stick with that. And I'll go to File, Export, Export As. It's now defaulted into PNG with transparency. That's good. I'll say Export All. This is going to be the Evening Jogger BW for black and white. And I'll go ahead and click Save. And the last thing that I want to do is I want to create a silhouette, a gray silhouette that I can use later on. And you'll see next class that there's logic for why I do this right now. So in order to do the gray silhouette, I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new layer. I'll come down here. And I'll click on the New Layer button. It gives me a brand new layer. And I'm going to fill this layer, I can just use my paintbrush, with a 75% gray. And so the 75% gray, to me, is about the right value, because you can make it darker and you can make it lighter afterward. So to get 75% gray that's neutral so that it doesn't have any blues or, or yellows in it, I'm going to look at my CMYK values here. And I'm going to put 0, 0, 0. And then in K, I'm going to do 75. So C, M, Y are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Those all have 0. And K is black. I want 75% black, which gives me a 75% gray that's neutral. I'll go ahead and say OK. And then I just need to fill it in. So I'll make my brush a little bit bigger. And I'm going to paint this whole thing gray. Perfect. So I have that whole thing gray. Now, it would sure be nice if I could use this mask up on that layer. Well, I can. I'm going to copy this mask that I created on the first layer up onto the gray layer. 
I'll do that by holding down the Alt key on the keyboard, and then I can click and drag the mask up to layer one. And when I do that, it's going to apply the mask on the layer for me. So I'm copying the mask. I create the mask once, and then I can copy it again. So there it is. Oops. And I just saw that I missed a little spot. Oops. See that spot right down there? That's going to that's gonna mess up my drawings later on. So let's go ahead and flip the colors so that I can paint. Sorry, I have to be in too much. There we go. Now I can go ahead and export that gray. I'll go to File, Export, Export As. There, I'll click on Export All. And this was the evening jogging, jogger, but this is going to be the gray. So I have the evening jogger black and white, I have the evening jogger color, and I have the evening jogger gray. And so I'll go ahead and click on Save. So I'm looking for those three things as my exports. So now that I've finished those, I've got my silhouette, that's good, it's time to move on and do another one. I'll go in and go to File and then Open, and like I said, I was going to pick one with the hair being a challenge. So here's a challenge for me. Uh, I won't spend the whole time doing it, but I at least want to show you this, the hair process a little bit more. So the tricky part about hair is if I were trying to cut this out, I'd have to deal with cutting out all of these little regions where the, the background is going to shine through the hair. And so if I wanted this to feel realistic on all sides, there's a lot of it here, uh, I, this is where that refined edge can really make a big difference. So first off, just like I did last time, I'm going to crop down the person so that I, ha I don't have any extra content. Like that. Unfortunately, the person is in grass, so if, if I were trying to put this person on a concrete pavement, uh, collage that person on, it would be a little bit difficult because I don't see her whole foot, but it's still worth it because of the hair, and I want to show you that process anyway. I'll go ahead and commit to it. There it is. I'll press Control-0 to make it big, and then I'm going to use my quick selection tool to make my selection. So there's my first bit of selection. I'm going to keep adding to. Lost her arm. I'll hold down Alt to subtract back her arm. Get her finger, I'll add that in. Here we go. Keep going. Pretty good. So when it gets to the hair, I'm going to kind of approximate the hair as best I can. So you're never going to get it quite perfect, but I want to kind of generally get it. All right, that works. Let me subtract out there. Perfect. So I've gotten the bulk of it here selected. Now when I go into that Refine Edge tool, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so I'm looking at the hair itself. And I'm going to uh, hold down Shift, go up to Select, and do the Select and Mask. And it's going to bring that Refine Edge tool. I'm going to view it. Um, we can do it on black. That's fine. My values, my smoothing was at 3. And this was at 0.3. And now when I paint over this, I'm going to make sure that I paint all of the hair as I start to do it. And you'll see that it's starting to isolate that, that bit of hair that is transparent. So if I were to show this on black on white, it's where you can start to see the wisps of hair. 
that I'm working on selecting. So rather than have to go in and manually select them, I can use this refine edge to work through where those little bits of hair would be sticking out. So it takes a little bit of time to work your way through it. Oop, that was her arm. <laughs> Probably not the right thing to, to work on. So sometimes that's why going back into one of these overlay modes can be helpful. I might need to make my brush a little bit bigger. Work our way around here. And like I said, sometimes you have to switch back and forth between these two uh, scenarios. The other thing that you can do at some point is you can go ahead and say, OK. You're back to the regular selection. And you can say, you know what? I made some mistakes. Let me go in and add. Like I didn't do that as probes. Sorry, Alt. Subtract that out. Like that. And I really need to add a little bit more in here because I didn't get that. Add a little bit more there. And then you can go back to that refine edge, hold down Shift, uh, go to Select, and select a mask. And then you can go back to that same refine edge, 3 and 0.3. And you can work through this edge again, getting more of the hair. So there you go. I'm doing a little bit better on that hair. OK, so once I have that, and I need to fine tune the rest of this selection just a little bit. But the point is, I have a good selection on her hair. Now I can go ahead and create that layer mask. Remember, I'm going to go up to Select and then Inverse, so that I'm selecting just her. And then I'll click on the Add Layer Mask. And you'll see that when I do it, it's isolating some of the hair. And look, there's, there's some of the green still showing through. I need to refine that edge a little bit more. But some of these large patches were seeing through the hair. And like I said, this is a challenging one to do. So it's a little bit hard to, to see where it is. And I'm going to have to touch this up just a little bit. Um, but that's the point, is the background's then going to shine through that particular bit of hair. This edge isn't particularly well done. So I would have to go back and, and refine that edge. Likewise, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the rest of her. Um, so it's just it's something that takes some time uh, that you really have to work through. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on for right now. I'm going to talk about the next thing that we're going to do. Um, but you guys spend time doing this. The longer you spend, you know, obviously I'm, I'm up here. I'm doing it in, in 10 minutes. I don't want you to sit here and watch me for 30 or 40 minutes to get it perfect. You guys spend the time to do it because it will benefit you down the road. The other thing to point out is that when we post it, you're going to add it to a gallery of a bunch of other collage images that students have done before. And the advantage here is that you can go back and borrow their work. Um, so you can create uh, a lot of these. So this is available under the Resources tab on the course website under Collage Images. And this is going to give you access. Here's all the people, for example. We can get into more people. And the more times these are, there are used or clicked on, the, the higher up they get in the ranks. So I can look here, and I can see a lot of the, the work that people have, have done in the past. And I can use any one of these, um, you know, for example, here. Right? I should see all three versions, same thing that I was doing. So the key here is, is finding high quality ones, spending your time, taking your time, and then you can go back and, and use these down the road. So the next thing that I'm going to do is something called a tiling texture. And a tiling texture is essentially an image that we make such that we can put lots of them together and they become a seamless image. And so we need to find some kind of a texture to work with. Um, and so I'll do a Creative Commons image search for this as well. 
I'll go to search.creativecommons.org. And we can do Google image, that's fine. And let's see, let's do, um, just trying to think here. All right, so I picked wood plank siding for lack of something better. And under size, again, I'm going to say larger than, in this case, 1024, 768 is probably the minimum. You could do the, the 2 megapixel. And here, I'm going to look through, and I'm going to try to find an image that is reasonably um, straight. So as I look at these images, some of these work better. Like, that would probably work pretty nicely. The, the, the sighting is nice and straight. It's fairly consistent. Others of these would be a little bit more challenging. Like this one's slightly in perspective. This one, for example, is in perspective. These lines go, they vanish off to the right here. I'd have to make corrections for that over time. This one here is a really nice image, except that they have a warp and a bend to them. So I'd have to make a correction for that. Let me go ahead and open that in a new tab. And like I said, that one's good. Unfortunately, that has those two light patches on it. That, would, that makes it less desirable. I kind of like this one. OK, so there's that wood. And I have no idea what, uh, what website I went to to get this. There's my download link. Let it finish its download. This one here is also nice. OK, there's, there's that image. That's good. It's a nice high resolution image. Uh, free download original. Oh, I have to log in. We'll skip that one for now. OK, so I have this one. That's a high, high quality image. And there it is. Let me go ahead and copy it, and I'll put it on my flash drive. And I'll go ahead and paste it here. There it is. Then I want to open this in Photoshop. So I'll right click and say uh, open with. Oh, I can't do open with because it's not linked up correctly. I'm going to go back to Photoshop. I'll go to File and then Open. And I'm going to open this image right there. And so this image is the, the idea here is that I want this such that, uh, let me see if I can explain it a little bit better. Uh, let me look. Sorry, you don't have to follow me do this. Just give me a second to give myself a little bit more space to work with. OK, so if I had this, this image here, sorry, give me a second. All right, so there's that image. If I had this image and I wanted to make more of that, and I wanted them to go together, if I put this image on top of it, we could tell that there's a seam there. Likewise, if I put another version of this image right here, we could kind of tell that right, there are separate images that are kind of glued together, and we're seeing this seam. I want that seam to go away. And I want to be able to do this such that we don't see the seam at all. So I'm going to back up here to where I just opened up the single image. There it is. First thing I need to do is I need to make some corrections. So like I said, this image has some skew to it. These lines are a bit bowed. I'll go to my Edit menu, and I'll go to Transform, and I'm going to use the skew command here. And when I do the skew command, I can adjust each side.
to get them so that they're more straight. If that's not working well enough, right, I may need to, to exaggerate this a little bit more. If that's not working, you could use one of the other ones. Let me cancel that one for a second. Again, under Edit and then Transform. Uh, and instead of Skew, I could go into, I think Warp will probably do it. This gives me finer control. I'm going to move these points up. I'll move that one up too. I'll move this down. I'll move that one down. And this first round, I did it visually. But I can also go to the View menu and turn on my rulers, and then bring down a guide so that I can see if those are, in fact, straight. So that one's straight. This one down here. This one needs to go a little bit further down. Like that. OK, so these are all nice and straight. So I made that adjustment. If you're struggling to make that adjustment, just pick a different image that doesn't need the adjustment. In my case, I needed the adjustment because the image had the warp uh, to begin with. So I'll go ahead and commit to that. Let me hide those guides so that you don't get confused here. We'll just clear those guides. So now I have those lines straight across. And I need them to, to be able to tile together. I've got a little bit of a clear, transparent spot on those lower corners. Let me go ahead and crop it down just a bit. So I'll make this a little bit smaller there. We'll make that a little bit smaller there. The other thing that I'm looking at is I have a line that's right here, and I have a line that's right here. Really, it would be nice if I was about halfway on one of these boards and about halfway on, say, that board there. Come down a little bit more. There we go. So I have that about halfway on those two boards. I'll commit to it. And so I've cleaned up this texture already. This, if I were to tile it, would look OK. It's not perfect, but it would look OK. So if I were to glue it together, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So at this point, I do want it to be seamless. I want it to look really nice. We're going to use one of the filters that's available in Photoshop. If I go to Filter, and I go to, um, I think it's under Other, and then Offset. So Filter, Other, Offset. I'm going to offset both the horizontal and the vertical, which is essentially what it's going to do is it's going to take uh, and split the image and recombine them together. So I can toggle this over, and we should be able to see it. There we go. So the this edge is now perfectly seamed to that edge. So if I were to copy and paste this right now, this edge here would match up perfectly with that edge. There wouldn't be any seam there. There is, however, a little bit of a seam in the center that I'm going to have to deal with. I'm going to do the same thing vertically, like that. So there's a little bit of a seam right there, and there's a little bit of a seam right there. I'll go ahead and say OK. And if I zoom in, I can see those two seams. So can you guys see that seam just a little bit and that seam just a little bit? I'm going to use a tool now to get rid of that seam called the Clone Stamp tool. It's available right here. It looks like a rubber stamp. And this rubber stamp tool, essentially what it does is it allows me to copy from one place and paste it in another place. So let me make this big so that I can hopefully show you this example here. So if I wanted to copy this right here, I'd hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, and I'd click. And I'm just going to do a single click. Now that piece where I, where I am copying from, I can paste it somewhere else. So I can take that, and I can move it over here, and I can paste it over here. So it's copying one thing and putting it somewhere else. Let me make the edge uh, really sharp here. I'm trying to find something that's, that's obvious that you'll be able to see here. Uh, let me clone stamp. Let me make it a nice hard edge so that hopefully this will be clean. And make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to hold down Alt. If I were to copy this part right there, see that little white dot? Right there, you're going to see that white dot again. So there's the piece that I'm copying, and I can put it wherever I want it. You can put it 
right there. I could put it wherever. So what I'm going to do, I don't want it to be sharp. I want to blur the edges a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my hardness. We'll do it about 30%. I'm going to hold down the Alt key. I'm going to copy from right here. I'm going to move over to right about there. And I'm going to continue moving over like that until I seam those two together. And so that seam, other than those three little white dirt spots, it essentially it copied that seam and made the, the black line that divides these two come together. I'll do the same thing. I'll hold down Alt right here, click, let go of Alt. And as I come over here, we'll move it up ever so slightly there. And we'll transition those two together. So you see how that now blends together. The texture in the middle here still needs to be blended. So I'll hold down Alt, copy a little bit right in there. Again, I'm holding down Alt to copy from and adjusting and then doing a little click. I'll hold down Alt again. We'll go right over like that. When you're doing this, you want to pay a little attention to the wood grain, hoping that you can get things to match up nicely. Yeah, about like that. That looks pretty good. I have a horizontal seam that's happening right here. This one will just kind of seam over that just a little bit. There's a little bit of dirt right there. I could just get rid of that dirt altogether. Like that. That looks pretty good. That looks good. I need to seam these two. I'll hold down Alt. And we'll transition those two together. That was a good example of having to pay a little bit of attention to the wood grain to make sure that the wood grain goes through uh, because of the wood grain. A little bit more up here. Let me make my bracket size a little bit smaller. I'll hold down Alt. And we'll make that one go away. Now if I press Control-0 and we were to look at this, it looks as if there is no seam in the middle anymore. I've gotten rid of that seam. And the advantage here is that once I save it, let me go to File, and then Save. Oh, sorry, I want to save a JPEG of it. I'll go to File, Export, Export As. This can be a PNG or a JPEG. It doesn't matter. There's no transparency to it. So it, it doesn't matter whether it's a JPEG or a PNG. There we go. I've saved it. I'll go to Export All. We'll put it in here. Uh, I'll call this Wood Plank uh, Tiling. Save. Now the advantage to this is if I were to show you this tiling, let me make that adjustment to so you can see it. You do not, by the way, have to confirm that it works. This is something I'm showing you in lecture format so that you can see that it does work. That. If I were to take this and copy it and paste it, when this stacks up to right there, you won't see a seam. You guys see how that looks like it's, if I were to paste this again to right there, you again wouldn't see the seam. We're getting a little bit of repetition because of that little knot that's showing up. If I were to paste this right here, it would appear to go keep going. Likewise, this, if I put it right there, would appear to keep going. This one up here would appear to keep going. It looks like there's a little gap there because I didn't, I didn't actually stick them together. So this is the advantage of a tiling texture, is that once you've made this, it's really easy to have this go on as big or as large as you want. And so I want to introduce this as a concept so that you have an understanding that this is something that you can make, because in collage work frequently, something like this is really useful. Okay. So I'm asking you today to focus on cutting out people once you've, once you've cut out a few people, I want you to try to make a tiling texture. Once you feel comfortable and made the tiling texture, go back and cut out some more people. Once you've cut out some more people, go back and make another tiling texture. Make sense? I'm suggesting that by the end of the day, you should have about five cut out people and about three tiling textures, ish. If you don't quite make it that far, as long as you're here and you're working on it, if you end up with just a couple of them, that's okay. 
but it's not a license to, to work for an hour and then leave. Does that make sense? So we're using the bulk of this time. This is really important for you to learn and understand how to cut out objects and how to work with these objects. Because once you've done this and you have that skill, next class we need to be able to collage in the objects together. You will use the people that you cut out today next class. So you do need to have those. Make sense? All right.